Welcome to Advanced Git. Uh, is there anyone in the room who doesn't know Git, hasn't used Git before? Can I see hands? <laughs> right there. Okay, there and there. Uh, you guys, uh, please leave. <laughs> now, you'll, you'll be all right. This is not going to be gentle uh, if you don't know Git. It, it's going to be a little bumpy, but you might learn some things. And then when it's time to have me back over here to teach an introductory Git class, that'll be just that much easier. Uh, but I am delighted to be here. I love JavaZone. I love Oslo. This is just nothing but fun for me. I'm Tim Berglund. I'm a GitHubber. I joined GitHub about uh, five and a half weeks ago as a part of the training team. So part of my job is to make it easy for the entire world to use Git and GitHub. Uh, a lot of that means I spend time in the classroom at enterprises who have bought our enterprise product. And fortunately, it means I also get to be places like this talking to you. T.L. Berglund on Twitter, T.L. Berglund at github.com, github.com slash training if you want to contact me. I'd love to hear from you. Now, you're not going to see a lot of slides today. I got a few because there are some useful visualizations that will help make some things clear. But I'm basically just going to play around with some things, if that's okay with you. Uh, this, this sort of thing, we got an hour, we got Git. I mean, you just can't really go wrong. So I'll do some things. And uh, if you have requests, I, I mean, I see these two lights and like the suggestion of people, so I might not see you, but um, you know, we'll just kind of play around and see where we get. And when it's time to go, we'll stop. That's, uh, that's really how this talk goes. So that's enough of the slides. Let's get rid of those and go to uh, the real outline, which is here in a text file in Sublime Text. And this is kind of what I want to cover. This is your basic incredibly aggressive outline for a one hour talk, but those of you who have Git experience, you should be able to keep up. You'll, you'll learn some things. Hopefully some things will be clarified. Uh, I like to teach people about the internals of the Git repository, mostly for, for autobiographical reasons. When I was first learning Git a few years ago, things didn't really click for me until I understood how they were put together under the covers. And I don't know why that is, but I've, I've got like this little cognitive hang up where if something appears to be magical, I don't reason about it. Like, I'm, you know, when it comes to fixing a car, I'm a, a fairly lame mechanic. I could do a few things, but I can't really reason about the system. So I don't, I'm not good at solving problems. But when I learn how the system works, like I did in Git, then I can think through it more. So I want to teach you some internals. So I'm going to do that. Uh, who, anybody, uh, was anyone in my lightning talk yesterday? If I could see hands there. A good number of you. I'm going to redo some of that. Not any faster, not any slower but maybe, maybe twice will work better. So we'll do that. Rebasing. Who rebases here? Oh, look at all of you. All right. You, got, you already know this. This is great. I'm going to make sure you really know what's going on in a rebase. For those of you who don't, you need to know. It's not that hard, but you need to know what is going on so you can think through whether it's a good idea. Believe me, when I teach teams how to rebase and, and try to connect that to branching strategy and release management strategy, this isn't a technical thing that Git does with graphs. This is like politics. I mean, people get mad at each other when, when they really try to reason through how to merge and how to rebase and what branches mean. So big stuff. OK, interactive rebase. Who interactively rebases? Rebase-i. You guys are so awesome. All right. But some of you don't, and you'll need to know what that is. It's not so bad. Maybe we'll cover rebase on pull. That'll require us to get up into GitHub and have some things going on in a repository there. Uh, that's pretty powerful stuff. That's something I recommend in all cases. Um, you know, maybe, I don't know, we'll do a pull request. We'll see if that works out. External diff tools, maybe we'll hit that. So Git has a diff command that'll show you how two commits differ or how your working tree differs from a commit or how your staging area and your working tree differ, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe you want to see that, so I'll try to cover that. Um, some fun tricks with logging. The ref log, if you don't know what the ref log is, that alone will be worth the price of admission. And it doesn't really make sense to talk about the ref log without understanding a little bit about how reset works. And this is normally an afternoon. But you guys are smart. OK, enough. Let's do it. Um, let's, let's get started. So uh, a couple more pictures. I, I kind of I do like some of these pictures. 
the architecture of a Git repository, this is what a commit looks like. Now, those of you who use Git and are familiar with it and, and are using it on your team and people branch and merge and pull and push and all that, you see a graph. Whoa. No, that was, not, that was not called for. There, okay. That's what we're supposed to see. You see a graph normally in the log of repository activity. Uh, this is not that graph. That's a graph of commits. This is what a single commit looks like, how a single commit is broken down. See, the weird thing with Git, imagine if you were explaining source control to an undergraduate who hadn't used source control before. You'd say, well, you know, you check in each version of a file, and, you know, you wouldn't want to store a whole copy of everything on every check-in, because that would be stupid, right? You just store the deltas or the changes from file to file, which is how almost all source control systems work. Most people assume Git works that way too. It actually doesn't. This is what a commit looks like. So you start at the very bottom. You start with some files. I'm going to make one of these files in a minute. Git calls them blobs. And they're stored in this object database according to the hash of their contents. When we write a file into Git, we hash the bytes and store it in this file based on those, those, uh, the hash of those bytes. You see the numbers 8D162 and 51D22 in those little boxes. Okay, those are just blobs. Now, those files live in a directory somewhere. That directory is represented by what's called a tree object in Git. And a tree object really is just like a directory listing. You see there, think of it as a text file. It says, well, I have a blob. The value of that blob is at 8D162. I could go look that up. And by the way, it's called logo.jpg. The other file is called draw.js. You get a file name by being in a tree. But a blob by itself, it's just content. It's not really a file. Now that tree, that stuff gets hashed, and we come up with 7E8B1, let's just say. And then that is going to be referred to in another tree. So we were just looking at a subdirectory called what? Web. And that directory has another file in it, a blob called index.html, which is referred to by its hash 9AB16, pointing off to that other object in the other directory. So in a, in a real project, of course, you're going to have lots of nested directories and hundreds or maybe thousands of files. And every single commit has a complete copy of the current state of each one of those files. A commit can't store deltas. It's pointing to trees which point to blobs, no matter what. Now, here's how we win. Uh, you can't store the same blob twice. You can refer to it many times. But if I have a file, say it's a, a megabyte of text or something like that, I'll, I'll, I'll hash it, I'll store it in there, it'll be a blob in the database. And if I want to have a new check-in that has that same file in it, well, I'm just going to point back to that same blob I already had. So you don't really duplicate content. You can't. You only store it once. And multiple commits can point to that same copy of that old content. And at the top of every commit is a single tree. When you make a, Git, a new Git repository, say git init monkey or something like that, it makes a directory called monkey, and then you go put files in there. You always have to start with that directory because if you look at this commit object at the top there, it's got a tree. That points to the root directory of the project. So that's really how a commit is constituted. Never is a delta stored in this context here when we're looking at a single commit. The commit also knows its parent, of course, because this is a a history, uh, it knows who committed it, it's got a message, all that stuff gets hashed. The hashes you look at as a Git user, that C67DB at the top of the screen right now, those are the hashes of all that, that stuff in the commit, including the tree hash, right? So if I change one bit in any file in my whole repo, it has to be a new commit because all those hashes are going to be different. They're going to roll up to the top. So that's how things are structured uh, internally. And let me, in the space of five or 10 minutes, uh, make that work by hand. This is kind of fun if you haven't seen this. So, uh, tree, do I, oh wait, what am I thinking? I can't do that. Yet I have to get in it, uh, let's see, what directory am I in? I've already got a project called Java Zone. And I'll call this one bits. And here I am. I'm in a Git repo. I've got that dot Git folder. And I'm going to go over here and do a little bit of command line shell scripting. I've got this uh, spiffy tree command. So I'm going to clear the screen, run tree, sleep for a second, and repeat. 
So over there in that, that's your right hand pane. Uh, hey, my right too, funny how that works. We're mirrored. I just wanted to be sure. I didn't want to say the wrong one. Okay, so your right hand um, and mine. You're looking at a, a listing, a directory listing of everything under .git. So this lets us explore what goes on down there. Now, if you don't mind, we're not using hooks. All that stuff in hooks is just a mess. So I'm going to get rid of it so it doesn't clutter up our, our display. I just I don't want to look at those things right now. Uh, all right, so here I am. I have no files. I have no history. Uh, I get an error when I try to run history. Status tells me nothing particularly interesting. So. Um, Let's go ahead and just echo some text here, and we'll use a famous poem you may be familiar with. Um, and the kings who ruled them had courage and greatness. Seanus Heaney translation of Beowulf, if you don't mind an Irishman doing that. Uh, so anyway, if I just were to echo that, there, there's the text, okay? I don't, don't want to make a file. I'm not using a text editor. That's way too mainstream. Um, this, is, this is hipster here. So I'm going to echo that, and I'm going to pipe it to a command that you might not know real well. It's a command called hash object. Now you've, unless you're a git committer, a git hacker, or a crazy person, uh, you probably have never used or maybe even seen this command before. But uh, assuming we're all software developers here, there's a really nifty lesson before I finish the tricks. A really nifty lesson that we can learn as developers that, that make us better programmers by looking at the architecture of Git. Typically, I would do this with the add command, right? I'd use a text editor, and then I'd add it, and then I'd commit it. Boring, mainstream. Um, add and commit are the top level commands that we normally see. They're called porcelain commands. Just so you think of the things that you use in a bathroom, you use porcelain. All right, this friendly user interface, you can kind of stumble around the middle of the night and figure out how it works. Gets lots of work done, very high level of abstraction. Think of yourself as an API designer. You've probably done that. If you've done it, I'm sure you've done it badly. Maybe you've done it well. I know that's true. I've, I will at least admit to having done bad API design. So what happens when you design an API is you think, all right, what do I have to do? What, what's the job and what's the abstraction that I'm exposing to the world? What am I talking about in my system? You come up with that abstraction, you say, okay, here it is, you document it, you publish it, people use it, they start finding some corner cases. They say your abstraction starts to break down here and there and in other places, I don't really like it. So you as an undisciplined, young, unprincipled API designer, you think, ah, okay, what I need to do now is screw up my API. Maybe the data types need to be a little more complex. I'll overload some methods so there are more versions of them because we have these corner cases we need to cover. And before long, you've got something that's, that's harder to understand and a much messier abstraction. Not what Git does. Git presents to you add and commit and log and diff and these commands that you know and love in the basic class. Underneath those is this entire other layer of maybe 120 commands called the plumbing commands. In the bathroom, you use the porcelain. Behind the porcelain is the plumbing. Usually, you don't mess with the plumbing unless you're a professional or something bad has happened. Or you need to do something a little bit unusual that isn't covered by the abstraction of the normal devices in the bathroom. So there's a word for this. This is called an onion skin API. The top layer of the onion is the one you present to the world, and that covers 80% of the cases. When it doesn't, you peel it back, and there's this documented layer underneath of other APIs. So you just became a better programmer, and I haven't even made an object yet. Um, let's do this. I'm going to use hash object, and this is something that add is going to call uh, under the covers. And there we go. Notice over here, I've got an object now. Let me shrink that up a little so it fits. Um, beautiful. All right, and it's given me the hash of that object. You see the structure here. My hash is 1E0D4EE, e, et cetera. I get a directory named 1E, and then the other 38 characters of the hash. Hey, cut that out. The other 38 characters of the hash in the actual file name. So I'm going to copy that. I've got now an object, and I can, I can print it out. Here's another, uh, another command that, that's printing out, pretty printing the contents of the file. And I actually don't need to present have all that. That's a little messy. I can just go for a little. I can ask what kind it is. And it says, oh, okay, that's a blob. Well, that's great. Now, 
Uh, I still don't have anything staged. In fact, Git isn't even upset that this file is here. So I'm going to have to update the index or update the staging area. Those are synonyms. And I'm going to set the permissions on the file. And I'm going to say there's my hash code again. I'll just paste that in. And I'll say this file is going to be called beowulf.txt. And did you mean cache info? Uh, yes, you did. Like that. And now status says, ah, I see you have a new file. So we've written to the index. Again, something add would do. Now, notice the file has been deleted and it's also new. Just let that sit for a minute. Um, there's, there's, there is no file. We're making this up as we go along. So I'm going to use another plumbing command called write tree. Keep your eye on the right-hand pane, the objects directory. Watch what happens. I get another object now, bf8cc623, etc. This guy right here, which is a tree object. So if I were to cat file that and ask what type it is, bf8cc, uh, it's a tree. If I were to ask to pretty print it, I get that directory listing. A tree is just a directory listing. So good, we've written that tree. Now what do we have to do? Well, moving along here, status is still a little bit unhappy. Um, I need to actually make a commit from that tree hash with this message. And I get a third object. There is actually a commit now. Let's see, does log work? Uh, log still doesn't work. What does status think? Status, um, let's be clear here, clear this. Uh, status is still a little unhappy. Hmm, okay, well, another internal to look at is, number one, under .git we have this head file, and down here we have this refs directory, refs heads. Refs heads is where branches are stored. So if you have a branch called feature and a branch called master and a branch called monkey and a branch called Java zone, those are all going to be files under refs heads. As you see here, we don't have a branch. Now head, oops, don't type over there, type here. Uh, head, <coughs> sometimes we use the cat command for that. Um, head tells us what, what we think we're on right now. What's the current commit? That's a symbolic ref in there saying, well, I'm not going to tell you the hash, but why don't you go look up in ref's head's master and figure that out from there, and that's why this is failing. So we need to write that ref, ref's head master. And for that, we have the outstanding command, update refs, and we'll write to ref's head's master with, not that, but uh, what was the hash of that commit that I've cleared away? It was BF, wasn't it? We'll, we'll find out. Somebody help me. Was it BF? We'll, fi we'll find out. This will be really broken. No, non-commit object. All right. Uh, cat file type 3F62. That's a commit. All right. So this thing, so we will um, update ref to uh, 3F and all that. And it's quite happy. Status is better. Log is totally happy. It's telling me all kinds of things. So I've got to commit. What I don't have in this extremely unconventional and hipster way of committing is an actual file. <laughs> so now that I've committed, I can go to a nice and familiar command, checkout. And I'll say, well, let me check out from the head. And what do you normally use checkout for? To switch from branch to branch, right? It's going to go to that branch or that hash and make your working tree look like that thing. I don't really want to switch branches. I want to grab a file. So I'm going to say, we're going to check out. We want to go to the head, but I just want to operate on the Beowulf, Beowulf file. Um, and you'll see the syntax in the status message. Sometimes it'll tell you to use this to revert if you want to rage quit your changes in a file and just go back to the way they were in your last commit. This is the syntax you use. And in general, this idiom applies to other commands in Git where you have Git, command, um, something, option switches, all that stuff in there. Dash dash separates all the option switches and parameters from a list of files. So if there's a command that can meaningfully be constrained to apply just to a list of files, you do it this way. Works for checkout, works for log, works for diff, 
works for things. So I'll check out. Status is finally happy. I have a file. And um, the hardest way to create a text file ever, ever with echo, I'm hardcore like that. There you go. So now you kind of see, hopefully, what is really going on with that picture of the internals. That is commit by hand. Let's see what our outline says next. All right, uh, commit by hand. We'll say, all right, we're done. Rebase now. Rebase, 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 rebase. All right, let's play around. I'm going to switch to another repo. And I'm going to take that away. That's no longer all that interesting. Uh, I'm going to go here. And instead, I'm going to go to a special command that I have called log live. And you wish you had it, but you don't. And if you don't have it, that's because you haven't asked me. I'd be happy to give this to you. Uh, it's in a gist somewhere. Send me an email. Uh, all right, here we are. We'll go up to the Java Zone repo. Now, I've already uh, created this repo. It's, it's got a few commits in it. Um, it's got a file called caesar.txt, which has some lines from Julius Caesar, the Shakespeare play, from the part where Mark Antony discovered that his friend had been murdered by bad guys, and he was saying a bunch of bad things were going to happen to Rome. That pretty much all turned out to be true. Uh, so bummer for him. Anyway, here we are. What do we have for branches? I got one. It's called master. Now, if you look at that nifty version of log I have, that's live refreshing. So you'll see that change as I play around with this repo. Uh, it says there's three commits. There's one branch called master, and we're currently on the tip of master. We're on the most recent commit because you see head and master both point to that top commit. Now, if I were to, say, uh, make a branch, I'm going to make a branch called feature. There we go. Now, feature also points to that same commit. You can kind of watch this happen in real time. It's kind of cool. Um, so we'll go add some more uh, code here. Like dumb mouths do ope their ruby lips and beg the voice and utterance of my tongue. Good enough. Uh, commit. Add m ruby lips. OK, now master has moved ahead a feature. Easy enough, right? We'll go ahead, and it's, it's nice to see this stuff. This is not advanced Git right here, uh, but it's nice to watch it happen. So watch what happens when I check out feature. The head is just going to move down to that feature branch. It's still rendering this, this kind of ASCII art graph thing. is still rendering feature beneath uh, master, but I'm on it now. And if I look at um, the, the Caesar file, I, I don't see the, the stuff that I just wrote. I'm, I'm not on that branch anymore. So anyway, let's go ahead and make a directory, put some files in it, and I will generate random changes. I'm going to make five uh, files called monkey.txt or file.txt, and this is a handy little script uh, because now all of a sudden, and that is, I'm going to have to shrink that font for your sake. Really, this is, this is because I love you that I'm making you look at small text because it needs to render properly. Uh, good enough. Good enough. Okay. Um, so you can begin to see the graph. You see master is kind of a branch off to the side. Feature has moved ahead of it. And suppose, here's really the rebasing scenario. Let me uh, make sure, because I know some of you said you rebase. Some of you said you don't, and I need to make sure you know what this means. When we merge, we start with a commit. Master moves ahead. There are commits on master. There's some branch. It moves ahead. There are commits there. And we get back to master, and we say, let's merge in that feature branch. And what that does is that creates a new commit. It takes all the blobs from E6.9 and, and trees from E6.9 and all the trees and blobs from 8B3, and it computes the difference between them. It does that by, by looking at three things. It looks at 8B3. It looks at E6.9. And it looks at A6.2, or A3.2, the most recent common ancestor of that branch. And emerge makes a new commit that has those two parents. So you get this branching and, and merging kind of picture there. You can see it in the graph. What if you don't like that, though? What if you don't want that to happen, but instead 
uh, you want this to happen. You think this is better. You say, okay, fine, there's A32. Uh, I've done some work on my feature branch. Master has moved ahead. But you know what I really want? I wish I had just branched right now from 8B3, and I instantaneously redid all my work on top of the, the state of 8B3. I want to make it look like we took turns rather than branching and working in parallel. So rebasing is going to take those commits, D19 and E69, rewrite them. Their hash is not going to be D19 and E69 anymore and make the parent of D19 8B3. It like moves them down, shifts those commits in time, and rewrites them. So now when I merge, I still have to merge, but it's a very trivial kind of merge, a special merge called a fast forward, which means I'm on 8B3 and I want to merge in E69 prime. I don't need to create a new merge commit because there's no work to do. Since there are no longer any new commits on master, I just need to move master forward to E69, and I've got topologically not necessarily a graph in general, but a line. My repo stays straight. There are some projects that are trying to maintain this discipline comprehensively, so no merge commits ever. Uh, there, that, that's another political issue. People, I've, I've never been able to convince someone of an opinion other than the one they started with about which is the right thing to do here. Uh, frankly, I've had more success in political arguments than I have in, in branching and rebasing. It's just terrible. So, uh, you know, you have one that you like, keep doing it, and, and GitHub loves you. So let's actually do this. This is over here safely away from electronics, so cap may stay off. All right, I want to help the graph look a little bit more reasonable. So I'm going to go check out master. I need another commit. Uh, oops, uh, I need another commit on Caesar. Um, a curse uh, shall light upon the limbs of men. Domestic fury and uh, fierce civil strife shall cumber all the parts of Italy and blood and destruction and all that stuff. Okay, uh, domestic fury. All right, there we are. So now we've got. Two commits on master, see them at the top there, head and master. Feature has got those five commits, and we still got a little bit of mess there. You know what I can do? This is, this, I'm skipping ahead a little bit here, but I, I don't mind. I don't mind. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just go here real quick, and I'm going to go to the end of this line. Uh, no, I said the end of the line, and I don't need the author name. So we're going to stop there. You guys didn't see a thing, okay? None of this happened. Um, no, I, I insist. Uh, doo -doo. Uh, okay. this, is, this is for your benefit. You're seeing how things work here. This is absolutely advanced Git. <laughs> All right, so did I? Oh, look at that. I didn't have to work my alias. Dang it. Uh, so I don't use the alias in uh, the log live command. I have that whole log mess right there. Um, so let's get the Tim, Tim's Bergland off of there. Uh, we all know who wrote these commits. Um, I just want a little more space to be good to your eyes. As I was saying, there's our graph. You see master. You see feature. I don't. Here's what I don't want to do. All right. I don't want to do that because now I have a merge commit. But, oh, wait, um, I did it. You ever do that? <laughs> like, wait, I didn't want to merge that, or that commit was a mistake, or, ah, you know. It, it turns out you have a tremendous amount of flexibility in recovering from errors like this, even if they are contrived for the sake of performance. Um, if I push this, if I go push this to GitHub right now, and somebody pulls it, I'm hosed. Or really, if I want to be a good citizen, if I push it, I need to assume that someone has pulled it. And I don't get to rewrite this mistake. Once it's shared, it's shared. But this is a local commit. It happens that all of these commits are local. So all of this history is mine. And I get to be master of my own little world here. Um, and, and, and that's a good thing. There are a few commands I could use. Now, if I just knew what I wanted to do, I could say, Look, I'm on master right now. 
I'm on master, and what I just did, I don't want to happen. I want to reset the commit that master is pointing to. I want master now to point to FC60168, the domestic fury commit. I, like, I want to undo the merge. So I could use reset hard. Reset is a, is a complex command. There are three separate flavors of it, uh, soft, mixed, and hard. Uh, hard, what hard does is it's going to change the value of master, the commit that master evaluates to. Show you another plumbing command. Rev parse. Anything that could be interpreted as a commit, uh, a, a branch, a partial commit, a, uh, or a partial hash, a tag, uh, or, or some other ref spec, any of these things gets parsed by rev parse into a proper SHA-1 hash code. So somebody make a note of that, 896E2C. Uh, somebody write that down. I'm not going to remember it. 896E2C. I still won't remember it. That's what master is right now. So we'll go ahead and get reset hard. That's going to change the value of master. And I'm looking over at my log here, FC60. Uh, that's enough. You only need to provide enough of that, that it's where, to where it's unique inside the repo, at least four characters. Uh, and, and this is a pretty small, you're looking at all the commits, and only one of them even starts with F. So that's definitely unique. And I'm going to reset hard, which means not just change what master is pointing to, but also make changes to the working tree. I should show you that. That's my working tree. I merged in that branch. It's got files, file one, file two, file three. Uh, rage, I don't want those. So I don't have them anymore. The merge commit is gone. All I have is Caesar. So that's reset. Now, what if I didn't have this nifty little log live view that I was looking at all the time? Well, your get out of jail free card is ref log. This is hot. All right, if you don't know this, you are now officially glad that you do. There are ways you can screw up that are kind of usually multi-step mistakes that are still a little inconvenient to recover from, even using the ref log. But if we look at what I just did, I wouldn't have to be looking at my nifty auto-refreshing tiny font log thing that I'm doing. I could just go to the ref log and say, well, the problem was the merge. Uh, that's what I didn't want. I, I, I would want to go to the commit before the merge, and that's effectively what I did. What if I regret even that and I want my merge back? Well, it so happens that head at one, by the way, you won't be surprised to learn that that's rev parsable. It's also resettable. Guess who's got his merge back? But uh, you know, I'm a little just wishy-washy. I, I just I can't decide. I'm going to go back to head at three. Uh, I'm really sure this time uh, that's what I want, which is the case with the merge uh, not having taken place. So there you go. That's reset and ref log. Use that. Now, when you reset, I'm, I'm, I've got two branches. I merged wrong. I'm thinking about branching, merging, rebasing. It's anybody's guess whether, since I'm in mistake mode here when you're using these commands, whether I'm on the right branch when I run reset. Please be aware of that. You have to think about the branch that you're resetting because reset applies to the branch that you're on. Uh, I, you know, I just reset a few times, and let me... Uh, Rev parse master again. That's not the commit. The last one started with an eight. Somebody wrote it down. That's not it, right? No, that's not it. You're not answering me. But trust me, it's not. Um, make sure that you, uh, you know, I merged something into master and I wanted master to be as if the merge had not taken place. Had I been on feature and I reset to that thing, horror show. Okay, you don't want that. Be on the right branch. I was. Everything's okay. I've done it the wrong way in class before. You can recover from it, and it's a, it's trust me, it's a teachable moment for somebody. Uh, all right, let's rebase for real. So when I rebase, again, what I want is I want those more recent master commits to uh, to have come first. I want my my feature work to now be placed after master, and so I have to check out 
feature to get there. My head moves down to feature. Good, sh good deal, good deal. And then I will rebase master. So what you should see in the log, you'll still see a master, you'll still see feature, but you're going to see a straight line after this runs. There you go. Ooh, you saw a cool intermediate state there too. That was fun. Uh, not necessarily atomic is, uh, is rebase. So master is not, and it's, it's actually not. And when you get, here's a, a pro tip for you. Now that you know how to use the ref log, if you want to ref log your way around rebases, that can be very complex. They can create dozens of ref log entries if they're, if they're big rebases. So be prepared to sift through that. Ref log is, or pardon me, rebase is kind of like super plumbing. It's like one of those, uh, I don't know if you have those here, but I I've, I've heard about this product like for gas station restrooms that it's this, this bathroom unit that gets installed and you waste connector and water connector and electricity and you, you close it every day and there are these spray nozzles and soap and it just like cleans itself out. Imagine, you know, a, a highway service station bathroom. You'd want that, right? You'll press a button and it just sprays all this water and totally cleans itself. You know, that's porcelain. <laughs> okay, there's, there's a sink, there's a toilet, and it cleans itself. It's kind of like rebase, super porcelain. So rebase can make a big mess in the ref log. Be prepared for that. And you actually saw a flicker of the non-atomic state of the rebase, uh, the repo, while that was happening. Um, Git's management of concurrency is not at this level. We don't expect more than one person writing the file system here. Uh, so anyway, that having been said, I am on feature. I've done the rebase. If I look at my files, if I cat out Caesar, I see domestic fury and fierce civil strife, and I see my files, everything looks great. I still, though, technically would like to merge master, right? So I'm going to go check master back out. Pardon me, merge feature. And when I merge feature now, there are no new commits on master to be reckoned with. It's a straight line. You can see it the, in the picture there. All I need to do is say, hey, master, you're not there. We'll just go up to the top right now, please. And that's what that is. That's what a fast forward merge is. And it says fast forward right here. A fast forward merge is simply moving the, the, the head, the branch, the ref, changing that value calling update ref under the covers. You know how to use update ref now. So um, check out, where, or pardon me, merge was doing just that. All right, we're keeping up pretty well here. We're good till 440, right? 1640? There's a lot more pain left. This is good, this is good. Let's just take a look at where we are. We rebased. No, no, I take that back. We, we said, oh, wait, 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 we did ref log and we did reset. And we sort of hinted at advanced logging. I'd like to tell you a little bit more about how that command works if we've got time. Let's look at the interactive rebase. Uh, because here I am, I'm looking at my, my history, and from the bottom up, I've got initial commit, noblest man, prophesy over wounds, ruby lips, a random change to file one, two, three, four, five. Yes, thank you for committing every 10 minutes because you felt insecure if you hadn't committed. And I now have a repository full of worthless commits. Here's the deal. If you are the kind of person who feels good about committing on a checkpoint basis, or more to the point, you get anxious if you haven't committed recently, that's probably a good trait. That's a better trait than every two weeks. So if you have to pick, that's so much better. But there's kind of this uh, sensibility in Git where a commit isn't really a point in time snapshot. I mean, it is, it, it can function as one, but a commit should tell a story. There are certain commands like uh, cherry pick, for example. Cherry pick is a command that lets me go grab a commit, say from somebody else's feature branch. I'm not ready to merge their feature branch, it's just not ready yet, but they have this one security bug fix that's in their branch, and I just need that one commit. Cherry pick will let you pull that branch over and say, identify it. They send you the hash over IM. It's 8D6B12. Say, okay, get cherry pick 8DB2, blah, blah, blah. And you'll take that commit and add it to your branch right where you are without merging any of the rest of the stuff. Great command. Okay, highly useful command. These top five commits are not all that cherry pickable. They're checkpoint commits. Checkpoint commits don't tell a story. They just, they just mark time. So a commit, a well-crafted commit in Git, Git is encouraging you, just by the shape of the tool, to make commits be cohesive, 
so that all of the changes in the commit relate to one another and uh, decoupled as much as possible independent of the commits before it and after it. Now, one, two, three, four, and five, those file changes there seem to be, for a complete story, very much coupled together. Okay, they're, they're all telling that, that same story. Or uh, to, together, they tell one story. So I don't like that. I want to fix that. And to do that, I'm going to use Interactive Rebase. Interactive Rebase uh, is like normal Rebase, just with a dash I. And you're going to give it the commit that's one past the commits you want to reconsider. You need a picture. This is not fair without a picture. How about a picture? So I've been a good boy, and I've rebased, and my, my stuff looks like this, right? If I interactively rebase those last five commits, I get to play with things a little bit. Say I want to nuke a commit. I never liked 8b3. It's gone now. Deleted from history. Say I want to reorder some commits. Uh, I teach Git a lot, and I've used it as a developer for a number of years. Still not quite sure why you'd want to do that, but let's just say uh, you could reorder them. A little bit more practically, you can combine commits. If you're a checkpointer, before you share any of those, and by the way, can you interactively rebase commits you've already shared? No, okay? Stalin can airbrush Trotsky out of history. That's bad. You can't. It's the same thing. Uh, once you've shared that picture, you know, you need to be the Ministry of Truth to go find all the versions of that picture everywhere and change them all. Let's not play like that, okay? Once you've said something to other people, stand by your word. If it's just a local commit, we have the power to rebase, and I have the power to rebase interactively right now. So combining commits, dropping commits, those are pretty practical cases. Uh, changing commit messages, all that stuff. So that's, that's really what um, interactive rebase is all about. So let's go back and do that. Now... I want to go all the way through FC60186, uh, like that, right? Because I'm looking at my log. I, I know that. That's a little messy. Uh, there's another syntax, and I'll prove it to you with rev parse. Anything that can be parsed, a branch name, head, a tag name, a hash, the tilde character, and the number of commits back, and there we go, FC60, et cetera. So there's a nice little language we can use to modify these things. And sometimes Z shell gets excited, so I have to uh, do this. I can also do that with carrots if I want. Five carrots means that many commits ago. One carrot is just one commit beforehead. So generally, it, when I'm in interactive rebase mode, that is really how I'm thinking. Five commits ago, that's the most expressive way to say five commits ago. So I run that, and up pops this editor that I'm gonna resize because there's no way you can tell what that means. Okay, sorry for a second log, you're just gonna have to be pushed to the side. My default commit editor pops up. Of course, my default commit editor is Vim because, well, that's the default and I think it's perfectly serviceable. Just like usual, Git is giving me some directions. I could be somewhat ignorant about what to do here and I could just go read what these commands are. I'm getting a list of commits and we see this is in reverse order. So this is the newest commit down here, the oldest commit at the top. That's the opposite of how we normally look at the log. And each one of them is being picked. I can reword, edit, squash, fix up. I can execute a shell command. Git will pause the rebase, go run some script, and change everything, and commit the results and move on. Extremely powerful stuff here. Uh, we're going to be easy on ourselves, and what I would like to do is squash all of these into the previous commit. And I can write the whole word squash or just an S. Uh, I have to pick that last one. They need to get squashed into something, right? Uh, you know what? Let's say, let's say I don't want three. I, I, uh, no, I like the number three, honestly. Uh, four, though. We've always been enemies. Um, I don't want that commit to be there anymore, so I'm going to squash up like that, and I think that works. This is a great thing to get yourself in trouble if you don't always do the same thing. Certain combinations are logically invalid, and it's hard to tell ahead of time. But let's just play along here. 
Good, that was logically valid. So we have a new commit that says, this is a combination of four commits, and it's glommed together all those commit messages. Now, if you hate human life, then you will commit something that looks like this as a, as a commit message. If you have a little bit of love for your neighbor, uh, then you'll do this, and you'll say some random changes to files one, two, three, and five. Um, winning. Uh, save that. Let's go ahead and make a little bit more room for the log so you can see what's happened there. Just one commit now. Used to be five, but I've just got one. And it tells a, a much more complete story. So let's go ahead and that's not going to be able to have that much room. We apologize for any inconvenience. Um, whoa, whoa, whoa. Nope, 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 nope. Out of control. The demo has spun off the wheels. All right, we're, we're good. That was a close one, you guys. I was, I was worried. Um, but I, I am, I am uh, just so unprofessional. Uh, this is just making me mad. So... Uh, we're going to get rid of the, the, the that and the that. And uh, no, no, stop, you fool. Get log live. Uh, the last tw oop, little, uh, <laughs> little, little too much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, uh, well, here, I wondered, is my... Um, I've got the time. I've got I've got the time. So let's uh, change the scripts. Do I have that in a in a game? Oh. <laughs> oh, what a fail! All right, uh, but I can do this, and I will simply say uh, L G and get uh, log live twenty. Oh, right. Um, back to where I was. And good enough. All right. We'll stop playing with that. Um, but it, it's an improvement. Now, why does it think I've, I've, you think I went into the wrong folder? Okay, thank you. Uh, I am in, no, I'm in Java Zone. Um, it's my other log alias. Um, hmm. I, I did, um, but that was a good thing. Well, well, let's check out the ref log, you guys. There's no reason to be upset, as the gorilla says. There is no need uh, to be upset. Oops, uh, back to Chrome. If you're not familiar with the meme, you need to be, so. There is, officially, no need to be upset. Um, let's go look at the ref log, because I, I am legitimately, legitimately curious. I'm not making this up, because uh, it shouldn't look like that. So, uh, oh, I did, yeah, okay. So, what I want to do is, basically, in, in most cases, undo is head at one. So, I'm going to... Um, Get reset hard head at one, and you're going to look much better. And we're going to move quickly on from this. Um, two dashes. Come on, words. This is a mass pair programming exercise. I'm counting on you guys. All right, get rebase dash i head at five. I don't know what I did, but I was uh, pretty easy. I'm not on the wrong branch. I'm on I'm on master. Thank you. Who said that? You are correct. I need to merge feature. 
That's why I'm confused, because it was supposed to be the next step, but we went and screwed around with the log. But again, you learned some stuff about how the log live script works, and you're glad. <laughs> After you're done with a rebase, this kind of rebase, merge, uh, particularly if you're dealing with a, a feature branch where commits might be shared, a rebase of this kind is essentially a preparation for a merge. All right, so my mistake, I didn't merge right away. So now let me merge feature into master. Everybody's okay. I see everything that I want. And um, I will now, because uh, do, do, I, I reset past that and I'm still a little angry at these. So get rid of four, um, squash, and And then we um, uh, rage quit feature, and it's done, see? <laughs> and we do have all the files we need. I got file one through two, three, five uh, are there. Caesar.txt is there. Everything is the state I want it to be in. OK, where are we? We are at ooh, nine minutes. We got to pick wisely. Um, I did interactive rebase. Uh, pull requests? No. Diff tools. OK, diff tools like never works right the first time. So this is going to be exciting. We'll end on a high note here. Uh, let's make some diffs. Uh, let me just go here. This is incorrect. This says, thou art the ruin of the noblest man who ever lived in the tide of times. That is so not iambic pentameter that it burns my ears. So you need that accent there to remind you to say livid, whoever livid in the tide of times, so that it scans correctly. Okay, that's a big deal, you guys. You're laughing. But uh, there we are, and that's the regular diff. If I would like to engage a graphical diff tool, uh, I can now do that. So... I have the perforce merge and diff tool installed on my computer. It's apparently free. I was having a discussion with somebody with the finer points of the license, and I'm doing this in goodwill and with a clean conscience, thinking that I've got this right. If counsel would like to contact me, you know, that's fine. But um, I've got this perforce merge tool. It's nice because it's free for some value of free and cross-platform. I can run on the Mac. Windows, Linux, and it all basically looks the same, and we just need to rig it up. To do that, we use the configuration mechanism. We set a configuration parameter. Let me tell you a little bit about how configuration works. There are three tiers of configuration in Git. Local, that's the highest priority stuff, and that lives in .git slash config. It's an INI file. That's how Git rolls. Makes me feel like I'm in college again. It's great. Um, Local is the highest priority. And if I set something like, um, like that, then the default is to put it in config. And that's fine. That's going to work just fine. It's not going to be a problem at all. Uh, if I want it at the, the level of all of the repos for my user, I call it um, global. And I can read that parameter out. And inside this repo, that's true. If I get up out of the repo, it's false. OK, so local overrides global. There's also one called system for computer-wide settings. That goes off in Etsy or Etsy uh, homebrew seller, you know, however you've installed Git or you know, Windows System 32, whatever, a, a global place. So there's, there's global. Pardon me, system, global, local. And to rig up the merge tools, we use the configuration mechanism to set merge.tool to p4 merge. Now, what, of course, does p4 merge mean? It means I have ahead of time, you know, like you watch cooking shows on TV and they're doing some complex recipe and they reach off to the sides. Well, here's the roux. We've already prepared this, and we'll just fold this in, you know, so you don't have to watch him do it for 10 minutes. This is that sort of thing. I've got that script that's just going to go reach into the application bundle of the P4 merge install and run this. You can get this from me. Uh, this is Googleable. This is super easy stuff to do. So I've got a script for P4 merge. If I run it by itself, it'll pop stuff up acting, asking what I want to do. But I don't. I just want to set 
the merge tool, which I just did disastrously wrong. I would never do that as a local config setting. One could, but it's weird. So I'm going to make it global, and I'm going to unset. Uh, here, let's do cat git config, git config unset, local merge tool. Ah, it's gone. Merge is still there, but that's fine. That's how git works. Uh, and I can now run diff tool, launch p4 merge. That's not annoying. Sure. And there we go. And I have an extremely tiny text. There we are. It's highlighting that word. If I didn't like that, I'd say, well, I want a global setting called merge tool prompt and set that to false. Boom, every time. Supposing, all right, this is crazy. What I'm doing right now, four minutes to go, is absolutely insane. Uh, domestic fury, fear, civil strife shall cumber all the parts of Italy. Uh, blood and destruction shall be so in use and dreadful objects so familiar that mothers shall but smile when they behold their infants quartered by the hands of war. It's bad. Blood and destruction. Uh, get check out. Don't worry, folks, this is going to work. B, uh, feature branch, Caesar, uh, that stuff is going to go seriously wrong in Rome, yo. Um, commit effective Shakespeare. Okay, we'll check out master, we'll merge feature, ah, oh, it's broken. Wait, what? There's no way that could possibly work. <laughs> All right. Uh, oh, I know what I did. All right. So, um, no, no, we're not done yet. We got three minutes. I am going to um, undo uh, the last thing I did. Hard head at one, and I don't have a merge anymore, and I have to do um, another commit, and. Dreadful objects. I branched after I committed. Dreadful objects so familiar uh, that mothers shall but smile, etc. Hurry! All right, there we go. Now let's merge feature and boom. All right, I don't like it. I have to go sort, sort through all that myself. Well, I can set at the global level the merge tool to be P4 merge just like I did with the diff tool. And I can set the merge tool prompt to be false. And normally I build this, I go through this uh, all slowly and build up the drama, but we, there's no time for drama. Keep uh, temporaries, set all those things nice and convenient. And now I can run merge tool and it just comes up and I can go down here and say dreadful objects so familiar. Uh, that mothers shall but smile when they behold their infants quartered by the hands of war. And with that cheery thought, uh, everything is resolved now. Status still thinks it's, 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 it's been added. I can commit. I've got a message. And there we go. The merge tool has worked. And um, we have what we need. So that brings us really to the end. Uh, we covered a whole bunch of what we wanted, a few things we could have done that we didn't, but thank you very much, guys. Been great having you, and thanks to JavaZone for inviting me out here. My pleasure to be here. Thanks.